Dando continuidade, teremos agora o módulo 2, Exercício Profissional em Arquitetura, Fiscalização e Controle das Melhorias Práticas, Obstáculos e Sucessos, Amplitude das Atribuições Profissionais, Arquitetura e Urbanismo, Regulamentação da Profissão, os demais, os desafios éticos. Convido para fazer a primeira palestra dessa tarde, que vai falar sobre o equilíbrio entre a regulamentação e as tendências emergentes da prática, o senhor arquiteto Miguel Rodrigues, do Instituto Americano de Arquitetos. Good afternoon. I heard someone in the audience suggest that I speak Spanish, but we were talking at lunch that English is so much safer because even amongst us Spanish speaking people, the different dialects have such significantly different meanings that I would be afraid to offend so many of you. As it is, I already have the unenviable position of standing here interrupting your siestas. So I will try and be loud and obnoxious and keep you awake. Um, but yet the task that we have before us is significant. So I'd like to thank all of the members and the leadership of the CAU, the CAO, and especially President Pinedo, Pineda, uh, for inviting me to come and share with you some information about how we regulate the practice of architecture in the United States, and more specifically, how we exercise our methods of quality control because with changing technologies, with globalization and with all that is happening around us in our profession, there are no doubt going to be significant challenges in those areas as I, I think you'll see as I work my way through. Um, from what I have learned in preparation for coming to speak with you today, the first thing I want to do is congratulate you on having the wisdom to recognize that there are other systems that you might learn from and simultaneously caution you that there are other systems you might want to learn from. And I mean that in all seriousness because we've heard this morning about systems that are 100 years old and I'm about to speak to you about a system that's 155 years old and systems with that much baggage are very difficult to change. Um, and sometimes I feel as if we're trying to change something um, that we really should start from scratch. Like my colleague Vicente said just before lunch, uh, I too would very often want to start from scratch. And yet, you have that opportunity, perhaps the only one in my lifetime that I'm aware of, to essentially create a system of professional regulation for architects from scratch. You have a blank paper which is a scary thing, but simultaneously a huge opportunity. And Roberto, you, you expressed your concern this morning about the challenges ahead and, and all of the work that you have ahead of you. But I will share with you what I shared with one of my colleagues around one of our favorite seminar locations, uh, the bar at any hotel we're staying at, uh, about the profession of architecture and the fact that architecture is in fact a profession of optimism. And if you think about that, uh, it's very rare that people sig commission significant architectural work when things are bad, and we all know that from direct experience, um, when things are sad, when things are anything but happy, celebratory, and optimistic about the future. And I think if you approach this from that angle of optimism, you will find that when you're done, you will have accomplished something that will be a big part of your professional development and more importantly those of the architects that will follow you, uh, that will live well beyond any of us here and that will have a great benefit for not only the profession but the people of Brazil and ultimately I think the world will be able to learn from it as well. Uh, as I said, I feel honored to have been considered uh, to come and speak with you. I, I have difficulty considering myself an expert at anything. Um, but I, I have been in leadership positions in the profession for over 19 years, and I've learned, I guess, an awful lot, uh, mostly what not to do. Um, but I, I have learned that uh, if you worry too much about things, your hair turns gray. Um, and if you continue to worry about it, it eventually falls out. So on that basis alone, 
um, I'm probably the most expert person you'll hear from today. Um, to be sure, I have learned a lot, and also to be sure, there is no question that modern practice is going to require a very careful balance um, between an appropriate level of public protection, a recognition at an appropriate level of the benefits of the profession, and then the needs of that profession in the way of a changing practice, a practice that is changing at a rate of speed of once a month and in some instances once a day, um, both because of technology, because of economic forces, and just because the entire world is globalizing. Our clients are already there and we are always struggling behind them to keep up. And that's one of the significant challenges of established systems, is the inability to be flexible enough to change rapidly enough to accommodate the needs of the profession with respect to meeting the needs of their clients. Yet, we can't just arbitrarily give up our responsibility to protect that public and wipe out regulation so that the end result is that architects can move freely but do damage more freely in a worst case scenario. So, I would like to begin by explaining to you briefly how we manage the profession in the United States. Um, I am not doing PowerPoint today because I didn't want the brightness of the screen to bother your uh, sleep, uh, but more importantly because, in all honesty, I would have put up a whole bunch of organizational charts that may not have had a significant impact on you. I'd rather that we focus on this conversation and hopefully, and I trust I'll be able to explain it well enough that you can survive that conversation without the use of PowerPoint. I also don't have to worry about how to, which button makes it move forward or backwards. Um, the most important thing that I will share with you before I begin to describe how we have tended to do it um, is the need for a sense of clarity, a sense of transparency, and an understanding of the importance of the people involved in whatever system you choose to create. Now, clarity and transparency seem to mean the same thing, but I'm really sharing it with you from two different perspectives. Clarity speaks to the need for the regulation and the laws and all of the rules that you put together to make this work, to bring it to fruition, have to be simple enough and clear enough for those that need to use those rules and laws to be able to understand them and be able to incorporate them into their everyday professional lives. One of the challenges that we have had in the United States is that our laws are old and as we change them we have a tendency to change only the pieces that we feel need change but those changes have unintended circumstances with other pieces and sometimes the language becomes unclear and then you have my favorite excuse of those that are being disciplined by the boards I didn't know. I worry about when they say I didn't understand and so clarity is important Transparency speaks to just that, very clear process so that everybody has an understanding of what is happening or what has happened. More importantly, that everybody has a stake in the result. We call it ownership of the result. If you play a part in it, it's not a mandate that's being imposed on you. And every time that I have let myself believe that I know everything I need to know about anything, I am very quickly proven incorrect. If that transparency is there and people can contribute to the process, not just from within the cow, but outside from the profession, you will be better served by that. So let's move ahead and let's talk a little bit about licensing of architects in the United States. Our system is not significantly different than the system that my colleague Richard explained from Reba this morning. Um, but there are some differences in that ours is separated uh, into different pieces, although we accomplish the same thing, and oddly enough, a lot of our programming is very much the same. But in the United States, and this is in part because we are the United States, we began as 13 individual colonies 
that figured out that it might be a good thing for them to get together. But in doing that, they wanted to preserve the right of each colony, now state, to be able to determine its own destiny. And so the concept, the, the most significant underlying concept of US law, after you get past the Constitution and the rights of the individual, is the concept of states' rights, which essentially means that every state has a right to govern its own people in the way that it seems or that it feels is most correct. Sounds like a really great concept, right? Except that what it created for us in the United States is 54 different sets of licensing for architects because we have 54 bodies, 54 boards that license architects in the United States separately. There is no national license. So I live in Florida, I have a Florida license. I have had opportunity to work in three other states, so I'm also licensed in Alabama, in Georgia, and in South Carolina. Why is that important? It probably isn't. But it leads to the next point that I have. With that comes a disparity of regulation. Regulatory systems that are not similar add to confusion, not the least of which is the fact that I have to track different uh, requirements at any given time with respect to how I practice, to how I continue my professional development, and generally how I'm governed by the people of that state that I'm working in. And while that is appropriate, what I am here to say is that it may not be absolutely necessary. If you really pick apart the differences and understand that within those differences, the solutions can be similar to each other, then you can begin to put together a system that is coherent from a national basis that has applicability at the regional level as well. We had to get there the hard way. We had the other system first, and it's only through a lot of years of collaboration between the organizations that I'm gonna describe in just a few minutes that we've reached a point where we have a coherent system that varies very little from state to state. In essence, the equivalent of a national license, except that it isn't a national license. I still have to get a license wherever I want to practice. Now, add that to the fact that in the United States, the title architect is also protected by law. And you have a situation where I cannot call myself an architect or act as one in a state where I'm not licensed as one. And the absurdity of that may not be as clear as maybe with the story I'm about to tell you where there are certain parts of the state of Florida where if you stray off the highway by a few miles, you cross the border into Alabama or Mississippi. Now I'm licensed in Alabama, I don't have a problem if I get off on that exit, but if I get off on the exit to Mississippi, I somehow magically turn dumber because I'm not an architect in Mississippi and I can't represent myself as an architect in Mississippi. That seems like it makes no sense at all, but yet it's the law. Now, Obviously, I'm using this to describe concepts I don't want you to get into. It's not that absurd. I would have to have gotten off that highway in Mississippi, walked up to the first owner of a McDonald's and offered to remodel the store. It's, you know, I'm offering architectural services. But the other part of regulation in the United States is that in most of those 54 jurisdictions, the offering of or the practice of architecture begins with offering to offer to, to practice architecture or holding yourself out as an architect. So I've given to you, to many of you, my business cards um, so that we can remain in contact. If we were in one of the states of the United States where I'm not licensed, um, some overzealous regulator might be in a position to say I've offered to practice architecture in a state where I'm not licensed. And therein comes the third piece that I said earlier, the importance of the people. Because any system of regulation is only as effective and as good as the writing that was, that was put on paper initially and its ability to be flexible. The majority of that flexibility comes from the people that are put in positions to interpret those regulations. 
and those people have to be ready to make those decisions. They have to be practical, and in my opinion, to the greatest extent possible, they have to be in practice themselves. Because only if you're in practice day to day do you really understand the needs of practice day to day. So we now know that we're crazy that we license um, people individually by state, that the title is protected, so I can't call myself an architect outside of one of those states, even though I am one somewhere else. Um, it's truly a curious system. The other question some of you may have is, I keep saying 54, and yet I, I would think most of you would know that the United States is only 50 states. Um, but we also license architects within the three, uh, what we call U.S. possessions, Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, and Guam. And then, like you, we have a district, a federal district, we call it the District of Columbia. And those are the four additional ones that make up that total. Um, the process is established by the legislative process in each state. Each state has a practice act for architects um, under a similar title to that or some variation of it. And within the concept of the legal system of that state, some of those acts are more restrictive than others. And when I say more restrictive, what I'm talking about is a, a system of laws where um, in the looser configuration, the Practice Act can simply establish the fact that the profession will be uh, licensed, will be regulated, and the means by which it is to be regulated. So there will be a board. And that's all that's in that law. And then the board is allowed to promulgate the rules that it feels are necessary to implement the law. But in other states like Florida, the law can actually include specific requirements. And in Florida, they include quite a bit of specific requirements because the way that our attorneys interpret the law, if the board doesn't, has not been given specific legislative authority to create a rule, then we cannot create that rule. And every time we create a rule, um, it gets reviewed by a group of attorneys whose job it is to figure out whether we really do have legislative authority to write that rule. So if I haven't convinced you yet that being a licensed architect in the United States is probably not the smartest idea, um, maybe I will before I'm done. I'm sure I'm getting there pretty quickly. Um, it's a fairly intricate regulatory scheme the impact of having more requirements in the law than in the rules is simply that the law is more difficult to change. And it is an open legislative process, which means that everybody can have a say in that process. As compared to rulemaking authority by the board, which is a, a quicker process that has to be public, but it doesn't have to go through all of the iterations that the legislative procedures do. So to the extent, and this may be a, a, a bygone conclusion, but to the extent that you can maximize the amount of the rules or the operational structure within the control directly of the cow and not from having to go to the legislative body, you'll be that much better served by that. Now, I want to talk to you about the regulatory scheme and how you get to become an architect in the United States because that's also different than some of the models that you've heard today. And if you travel in the US a lot and, and deal with architects in the regulatory scheme, one of the things that you will hear is the term three-legged stool. And the three-legged stool is an analogy for how we license architects specifically to indicate that as most of you, since we're all architects, should know, if you remove one leg, any leg, from a three-legged stool, you'll be sitting on the floor, the stool is not going to work. The system is designed so that the three parts are integral to each other and it cannot work fully, cannot fully discharge its responsibilities without all three legs being in place. Those three legs are education, experience, and then examination. So unlike most of the other systems in the world, we graduate someone with a degree in architecture which has to be an accredited degree. We'll talk about accreditation a little bit later. Um, but you're not ready to be an architect just yet. Once you graduate, you are required to acquire uh, approximately three years of 
practice experience working under a licensed architect, and then you have to take an examination that is an examination that focuses on what you learn in your experience in practice. The examination is not designed to retest what you learned in school. It is designed to test what you learned through your experience, and of course the background is what you learned in school, but it's focused on the actual practice experience. And until very recently, they had to follow that order. The, the body that coordinates this insisted that you could not take the examination until you were done with the experience. We've recently been able to change that. Um, finally, after beating each other up for quite a long period of time, we all agreed that in reality, it didn't make a difference if someone took the exam while they were still gaining the experience because if they had learned it, they would pass the exam, and if they had not learned it, they simply would not pass the exam. So if you trust that the three pieces are designed to work together and cannot work separately, then when you take it, when you take the exam relative to where you are in the experience trail, should not make a difference, and we all finally agreed to that, and so today, you can take the exam the day after you graduate with an accredited degree. But the accredited degree is still the first step. Now, the problem with this, and it's, it's, it's a good thing, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on the experience piece to, to give you a sense of how sometimes unintended circumstances can create challenges that, because they're unintended, were not foreseen. Um, we've always had the experience requirement in the United States. When I was going through school and I graduated from the University of Miami in 1981, um, the requirement was still a calendar requirement that was in the law. At the time, if you graduated with a Bachelor of Architecture, which was the minimum uh, professional degree, you were required to acquire three years of professional experience. If you graduated with a Master's, that was reduced by one year, so you had to acquire two years of professional practice experience. The problem with that system, the way it was set up, is that there was no control over what that experience was. And so you could literally have worked for an architect as a supervisor, but have been doing the very same task, pick your task, whatever it is. The, our favorite saying in the United States is drawing bathroom details which at the time before computers seemed to be what every young graduate architect was forced to do. It was our rite of passage. Um, and never get experience on the other areas of practice which are, I think you'll agree, essential to the formation of a complete architect. And so because of that, and similarly you could have been working under an architect that happened to be licensed but was not working in a traditional architectural role. So, what came about was the establishment of a program that we, ca we call the in Intern Development Program, IDP. In the United States, like in a lot of the world, we're all about our acronyms, our initials. So IDP was created by taking the three years of experience, calendar experience, multiplying that by the number of hours that you would work if you were working a normal eight-hour day times the number of working days in three calendar years, and they came up with a number, and, and I'm not as good as numbers or with numbers in remembering numbers as some of my, some of the prior speakers this morning were, but the number was somewhere in the range of 730. And they established that as 730 units of learning, where each one was an eight-hour period. And then they went about determining what was it in practice that it was important for an architect to know so that before they were sort of cut loose to go out into the world and be an architect. And so that 730 some units were broken up into a certain number of units in contract negotiation, uh, client communications, uh, project management, uh, design of uh, preliminary design, schematic design, you name it, you all know what those competencies are it was broken up. Now up until that point, it was an incredibly intelligent decision. And that was a system that was created. I actually, when, when my license was ready to be issued, I had my three years, and the state lost my application, 
briefly. And when they found it and apologized for, for losing it and delaying my license, they, uh, they added, we think we want you to do this IDP thing in those exact words. And they had realized that they, they really wanted to implement this, but they hadn't established the rules. The rules had already been written as part of the program by a national body. Um, and, but they essentially asked me to go back and recreate three years of my experience and break it up into all these little units. So I went through a really marvelous exercise of uh, paperwork, which took me about two months. And fortunately, I don't move around in, on my jobs a lot, so I was with one employer the entire time, which made it easier. But the unintended circumstance that we're seeing today is that as the different factors of practice affect the intern's experience in the office, and those factors can be anywhere from the economy's terrible, there's no work, to the economy is fantastic, there's too much work. We all know the different pressures that that puts on people that run professional practices with respect to getting the work done, what little or what much of it there is, in time for meeting all of the necessary deadlines. The result of that is that sometimes it's difficult for the intern architect, which is the term we use, to be able to acquire the specific hours within the specific subject matters that they need in a nice sequence so that they're done in three years' time. And what's happening is the last numbers that I have are that the typical architect takes about five and a quarter years to get through the three-year experience process. Now that has all kinds of ramifications, particularly when we talk about diversity in the profession, when we talk about the differences in uh, economic situations, uh, you know, the, the resources available to the, that particular person, it has all kinds of implications, but generally the system works very well. And having had a lot of experience with systems, I was just in Spain last week, where in, in Spain, and I was in Madrid specifically, the universities literally graduate an architect and license the architect simultaneously. So the next day the architect goes to the local colegio, gets his inscription, set and is free to go out and design buildings. Am I, I'm not, you, you, you jump up and tell me if I'm, if I'm not making sense, but I think I got it. Um, so in my conversations with some of my colleagues in Spain, they recognize the need for some sort of experiential uh, portion of the creation of an architect. The UIA has been talking about it. A lot of the profession has been talking about it. And I want to share with you that it's important that you ensure to the best possible means that you can that that practice experience is broad and in the different areas that are necessary, but caution you to be careful in how you expect someone to collect that experience so that you don't run into the unintended circumstance that someone could potentially take six years to complete three years worth of experience. That's, that's a pretty critical piece of the puzzle, even more critical when you hear the rest of what I have to share with you. So, the next step is, at some point, you're going to take this examination. We call it the Architects Registration Exam, or I promised you we like acronyms, the ARE. The ARE is a seven-section or seven-module uh, exam that is now available computerized. So once you are cleared to take the exam, you simply call a local center and schedule an appointment to sit for any one or all seven of the parts. Take it, pass it. If you don't pass it, you can retake that part, oddly enough, as many times as you need to. Although we now have a rolling clock where the parts that you do pass will expire after five years because we all agreed that in five years, the training will, will have changed significantly enough that it warrants you having to retake that portion of the exam. But if you fail the exam, you have to wait six months, another unintended circumstance. The computerized exam was a great idea. It makes it easy, it makes the schedule flexible, and you can take it pretty much where you need to take it. Before that, because of the logistics of setting up an examination in a huge room like this, the examinations were typically given only once a year and in one city of the state that you lived in. So if you were in the wrong city, you had to take time off from work, travel to the city, stay overnight in a hotel, you understand. 
So now with computers, we got rid of that. But because you have to maintain the integrity of the computerized exam, the material for which rotates on a six-month cycle, if you miss or if you fail a section, you have to wait six months to retake that section. So put yourself in the shoes of a person that is incredibly intelligent but doesn't take tests well. We all know people like that. Okay, I'm the other way. I'm ex extremely dumb, but I'm a great taste, uh, test taker. So for me, the test was a piece of cake. I passed it all on the first time. It was great. But not everybody's that way. And you can very, very easily fall into a situation where it could take you several years to complete the exam. And in fact, the latest averages that I've seen also point to the fact that most exam candidates are now taking about five and a quarter to five and a half years to complete the exam. So we're all reasonably intelligent people in this room. Let's do the math. If it takes five years to do the exam and it takes five years to do the experience and it takes five years to get the minimal professional degree, you're talking about 15 years from the point at which you thought, hey, being an architect might be a good thing to the point where you can actually tell someone that you are an architect, but only in that state, okay? So what I hope you pick up from this is not that I think our system is terrible. In fact, I think our system is pretty darn good, but it has difficulties that I know can be overcome, particularly when you look at it from a fresh perspective, which is the opportunity that you have, the opportunity that you have that we did not have, because we backed into this. And I, that's why it was important, I'm sorry if I'm boring you with the history of it, but it's important that you understand where we came from so that it gives you a better idea that we're really not as dumb as we seem to be by virtue of how we screwed up. We just screwed up because it happened. Um, so now you're an architect, and those are the three pieces. And you're on your own, and uh, good luck. Now, of course, it's not that simple. We also have uh, the need for mandatory continuing education. I hate that term because what it really means to me is I need to count the points. The points being the number of hours that I have to sit through some seminar that I might not have really wanted to sit through, but it was the only thing that was available and I needed to renew my license and I didn't have any more time left. I prefer to consider it professional development or continued professional development. It has such a sweeter name but it is factual. And the AIA began this for its own members at approximately the same time that the regulatory bodies were starting to have the same conversation. And it's only because of the deliberative nature of decision making in the AIA that the AIA's mandatory continuing education program for membership didn't become enforceable until about two years after the first of the states ma made it mandatory for renewal of the license. The current number in most of the jurisdictions, and the last number I have is that of the 54, 47 of the jurisdictions require uh, continuing professional development. The current number uh, is on average 12 hours a year. Now, you won't see it in that form because uh, some states like Florida licenses every two years, renews licenses every two years, New York renews every three years. So if you look at New York's rule, it'll say 36 hours. That's, you know, 12 per year for three years. If you look at Florida, it'll say 24 hours. But that's a requirement for maintaining your license in 47 of the 54. And I'm sure before long, it'll be in all 54. And we also have the same requirement uh, within the AIA to maintain your membership. In fact, the AIA, and I don't quite agree with it, is now reducing its hours. The AIA created its system in an effort to make their members um, to be perceived as better than the non-AIA member. And obviously the AIA is, is, a, is, is an independent organization. That's a marketing trick that you know, I would not put beyond any other organization. Uh, they're now bringing it down to 12 so that it matches what the typical is across the board, and I don't think that matching for the sake of matching is necessarily always a good thing if, in fact, you feel that 18 is the right number. So if you feel that 12 is the right number, or in your case it might be 8, 
or it might be 24. You know, you need to look at it from the perspective of what it is that will make sense to ensure the continued professional growth of the licensed architect in Brazil. And by all means in the United States, it is the intent of continued professional development that that material build on the basic core competencies that you're required to have to get your license initially. So in theory, that means that you shouldn't be going back and taking courses that you should have taken in your second year of, of the university or your third year. And one of the biggest arguments we've had over the uh, past decade has been over AutoCAD. And of course, the, the, uh, the older professionals would claim, well, for us, AutoCAD was not in our education. We learned to draw by hand. And, and I said, well, you're right. And you really need to get this training. But at a certain point, and I think we passed it about two or three years ago, uh, AutoCAD or some version of electronic drawing uh, has become the primary means for communication uh, of technical documents anyway in the profession, at least in the United States. My argument is it's no longer, it's now a core competency. It shouldn't be continuing professional education. So the lesson to be learned with respect to that is that the professional development should have a significant or as significant an impact as possible on that professional. It really should enrich or enhance their abilities to function as an architect. And that should be the primary element that you look at in determining whether something should be considered to be continuing education or not. It shouldn't be about counting points to make sure that you meet a mandatory requirement because then it loses the essence of that learning and people are going through the motions because they, they simply have to. Instead, to the extent that you can create a system that architects can use this professional development tool as a means to gain competencies in areas that perhaps they don't have, uh, whether it's a specific project type or perhaps they're stronger in architectural design and not as strong in urbanism, Whatever that is, if that tool can fit that function, then the continuing professional development program that you will create will have so much more meaning to your architects and be so much more beneficial uh, than you would ever imagine um, that they could be. So I want to talk briefly now about the, the role of the professional organizations in the United States um, so that you're clear about how they operate. They, there really are five professional organizations that I'm going to talk about. We refer to them as the five collaterals, just as you have five groups I heard you say yesterday. Um, but each one of these five are independent, nonprofit corporations. They're not government agencies. We don't have a, uh, since we don't have a king or a queen, we don't charter our uh, organizations like is the case with REBA. Um, and they're all set up to perform some function. And I'll go over them right now so that you get a sense of that. And I'll start with the American Institute of Architects in part because I'm here representing them and it would probably be the politically correct place to start. Um, but also because they're the oldest. Um, and the history of the AIA, which is not known to many of its members, oddly enough, is very curious in that it was created precisely to form the profession of architecture in the United States at a time when architecture was not a profession. Uh, anybody could, you know, really call themselves an architect. There wasn't a measure, there wasn't a standard. Uh, you had uh, builders that called themselves architects, you had sculptors, artists of all kinds, and certainly some of the uh, famous names in architectural history were not architects. It's kind of odd. Um, but that all happened in 1857 in New York. Thirteen original members came together and decided that it would be beneficial for the United States to create and formalize the practice of architecture and so the AIA was formed. So we're talking about an organization that's now 155 years old. Talk about having a lot of baggage. But its primary purpose was to create the profession. So today in the United States, and there are those that would argue with me about this, everything that has to do with the practice of architecture, and for that matter, most of what has to do with the construction industry, 
was in one way or another formed, uh, institutionalized, standardized, and managed and, and com continuously updated by the AIA. The current role of the AIA is one, it is a professional organization. It represents the practice of architecture. Actually, it represents the profession of architecture, the individuals. Um, we, like the REBA, in fact, it was interesting. I was telling Richard that I was just going to sit here and go uh, take his slides and substitute AIA for REBA. And programmatically, you have a good picture of what AIA is. We have knowledge communities. We have a strong legislative body. Um, the knowledge communities are part of an overall knowledge commitment to be a knowledge-based organization where it's our goal to provide the knowledge that our members need to succeed in practice and to continue to grow in practice. So we conduct research, we uh, generate uh, certain bodies of knowledge uh, surrounding BIM, for instance, or integrated uh, project delivery, which some of the newer ones, sustainability, which dates back now to 2007. Um, that's part of the operation of the AIA, in addition to being one of five players in what is the regulation and management of the practice. At some point, it became um, of interest to separate the regulatory piece from the AIA because there's a certain conflict of interest that you can claim. You know, if you're representing the profession and you're representing regulation, you know, sometimes that's not always a clear-cut difference between the two. And so an organization called the National Council of Architectural Registration Boards was formed. Uh, at the suggestion of the AIA, although they won't admit to it. Um, and the function of that organization, which a lot of people think is actually the licensing body, and they are not. In fact, they have no authority with respect to that, with some difference, with some exception. Um, but the function that they serve, which is a super critical one, is to coordinate the efforts of the 54 independent state boards so that you develop that similarity between them and the portability of the credentials becomes easier. And that has happened. Uh, to this date, there's really only one state that I know of that has anything substantially different in licensing, and that's Alaska. They seem to think that they have different Arctic conditions that you have to take a separate test for. I don't understand why, but I guess they have their reason. Um, other than that, licensing in any of the states is the same. Over time, they've also become the record keepers so that an architect's professional credentials, if you choose to be a record holder, which is the term that they use, pay a fee for them to keep those credentials, they will keep that for you. And that facilitates the, the portability of the credential so that if I start getting off the highway in Mississippi too often and I decide that I want to become an architect there to stay out of jail, I don't have to necessarily negotiate directly with Mississippi. I can use NCARB to have them send my record to them, and they will license me by reciprocity based on that data. But the two other key roles that NCARB plays today is that they administer and operate both the ARE, the examination, and the IDP program. So they play a huge part in two of the three legs of the stool uh, with respect to licensing, although they themselves do not issue a license. Now, the next group then is the American Institute of Architecture Students. I think that, that one's obvious. Um, we have felt for a long time that the students have a seat at the table, that they have something very definite to contribute. In fact, like my colleagues this morning, I am impressed every time I listen to students talking about what their needs are. And they continue to impress me. They are in very good shape. The profession is in very good shape. But while they were part of the American Institute of Architects originally, it was also determined at the time that it would be better for them if they were independent so they could act as their own organization. So today they stand as a separate organization and all of the other collaterals contribute to their funding to make it simpler for them. Um, the next one is the architectural, the, uh, sorry, the Association of Collegiate Schools of Architecture, which essentially represents the schools, academia. Um, and that's a pretty obvious function, so I won't spend a lot of time with them because I am running out of time. And then finally, the NAB, the National Architectural Accrediting Board, which is the body that accredits education in architecture. 
and is the only body that does that. So of the 54 jurisdictions in the United States, in every one of them you have to have a NAB accredited degree as part of your education. There are only five or six of them that have other routes, but every one requires the NAB accredited degree. Accreditation of the schools of architecture is a very intense pro uh, process which since we'll actually be talking about that tomorrow, maybe, and I'll be on that panel, I can share more detail then. Um, but essentially, we look at the outcomes. It is an outcomes-based system to allow the schools the flexibility to teach the practice, to teach the profession of architecture in the way that they see best fit. So what happens in the United States is you can actually choose your school based on what part of architecture really attracts you the most. But the outcomes are all the same. Now, I don't want you to think that we're just looking at the outcomes because we're looking at 11, 12 conditions, the 12th is the outcomes. The other 11 deal with the institution uh, at the program level. Does the program have enough faculty? Is there enough support from the university? Do the faculty have resources to be able to improve themselves? Are there resources for the students to be able to get out of the university and travel to other places where they can enjoy architecture, learn about architecture in that way? because all of those elements contribute to the outcome and we don't want to be looking just at this. And finally, about accreditation, I will say that it's not a once-in-a-lifetime deal. It's a pretty intense pro pro sorry, process that must be repeated every six years. The longest term of accreditation is every six years. There are three-year terms for programs that are in trouble of different means or just starting, but every six years you have to go through that. So, what happens in some systems where they accredit at the beginning and then nobody ever comes back and you never know whether the airplane runs out of fuel and crashes or keeps getting refueled and stays level, we've developed that that consistency of minimum competency is, current, is, is maintained along a timeline. So I've given you a, a bunch of the pieces. I want you to think about the challenges that are going to come about when we start talking about globalization of practice, the outsourcing of work to other locations other than the office where you're located at um, with respect to how we can apply what we call responsible supervisory control, which is the architect has direct charge and responsibility over the preparation of the work. Now, I'm not telling you it's not possible, but I'm telling you that our systems in the U.S. right now are having difficulty with that challenge. And it's only through that creative interpretation of some boards that we've managed to, to avoid a huge argument about this. The truth is that if you're going to be intimately involved with a project and you're going to do that remotely by electronic means, which the capabilities for that exist, then we have to look at applying that in different ways. This is your opportunity. The fact that you are able to look at this not from how we did it for the last 50 years, but how we need to do it for today and more importantly for, let's say, 10 years. Let's not get crazy and say 30 let's just say 10 years. This is your opportunity to consider those challenges in light of the experiences that we've had and, and the things that hamstring us, that, that, that hold us back. Remove those because there is a way for an architect to apply responsible supervisory control using online means. There is a way to ensure the quality of the product that we're delivering to our clients with current technologies. You have the easier opportunity of finding those because you don't have the baggage of the past. So I'm going to close by simply reminding you that your greatest opportunity in developing a new regulatory scheme comes from the fact that you are developing a new regulatory scheme. Um, I think you are incredibly intelligent, your leadership particularly, to understand the value of creating a seminar like this and have this discussion with a bunch of boring people that share a bunch of information that is all going to, by the way, by the time we're done tomorrow, it's all going to run into each other. Um, but that's okay, because maybe that booyah base will make a good dish for dinner, right? That is your greatest opportunity. And I know that you will not let it pass you by. I look forward to seeing the results. I look forward to then speaking about your results at some event in the future where I'm sharing the best and brightest of regulatory schemes with other groups that want to know. And again, I thank you for the opportunity and for your patience. Um, I've been looking at your eyes. Uh, there are some of you that have been nodding off, but it's the minority. I thank you for that as well. I look forward to sharing with you the rest of the conference. Thank you again.